All right, let's get going. So uh, we're in the final stretch today. I'd like to remind everyone that the final exam for the class is uh, a week and two hours from right now. Um, it is in this room, 7.15 next Monday. Uh, homework 7 is due on Wednesday in class, as before. And projects, uh, the projects are basically due in the coming uh, days and months. Project 4 has been posted. We should have a testing framework up uh, for that by the time the project uh, 3 deadline is up. Uh, reminder, project 4 is optional. Uh, basically, we're going to take the best of three. Uh, sorry, the best uh, three of four. All right, so um, let's let's move on to today's topic. Um, so today's today we're going to be looking at a uh, something that is a little bit of a taboo in the database community, but that has recently picked up uh, a lot of steam uh, just because it's makes people's uh, programmers' lives so much easier. Uh, if you've heard of Hibernate, Rails, or Django, basically this, this is kind of one of the core uh, things behind today's lecture, or uh, implementations of, of today's lecture. So uh, the tagline here, uh, as you see, uh, saving the world one object at a time. Uh, in this case, I mean uh, saving in the uh, save your file sense. So. Um, what is an OORDBMS? So let's start out with some terminology. Um, Object-oriented and relational are both models for representing uh, different types of data. They're both ways of, of looking at uh, different types of information. And each of them has certain kinds of applications. But there's the representations of data, and as such, they have a lot of common things between them. Uh, so, uh, if you'll uh, indulge me, class and relation essentially refer to kind of the same thing. A group of objects versus a, a group of entities, or a set of entities. Uh, object and row tuple. Uh, a object is an instance of a class. A, a row or a tuple is uh, an entity uh, in a relation. And the same thing for uh, fields and uh, columns, uh, pointers, and foreign key references. Basically, these two things are, are kind of trying to describe very similar concepts. Uh, they're just going about it in a bit of a different way. So basically, these, these are two different languages for talking about data, but they're really uh, kind of the, the core concepts are very similar. Now that said, object orientation has uh, a number of its things that it approaches, uh, ways that it approaches data uh, that are kind of different from the relational model. Uh, so the relational model doesn't really have any notion of verbs. Uh, you can't say everything is done through queries, uh, whereas, uh, the, whereas object-oriented languages typically have uh, methods on their objects. So you can uh, talk about an object uh, as the object of a sentence, or, sorry, as the subject of a sentence. Um, more importantly, objects can have nested collections. So I can talk about a object, uh, let's say, uh, for example, a student being associated with a set of classes that the student is currently taking. That kind of uh, connection does manifest in, uh, through foreign key references or through uh, many-to-one relationships in a uh, relational in a relational uh, model, but it's not quite as clean. There's, uh, the classes are not conceptually encapsulated in the, the uh, there's no ownership, uh, no notion of ownership. Um, and what that kind of leads to is a lot more uh, lookup along these, these kind of pointers ends up being much more verbose. Uh, so if I wanted to find, uh, for example, the teacher of a student's uh, class, uh, the, the, the class or the instance of uh, databases that a particular student has taken, um, I, would, I could express that through a very simple uh, set of subscripts 
in my um, <clears throat> in an object-oriented language. Uh, the same expression would be considerably more complex if I wanted to express it in SQL because I'd have to express the entire join query. Now natural joins are one way of kind of simplifying this a little bit, but even so, the uh, this kind of pointer dereferencing is a little is uh, considerably easier in an object-oriented framework. So that's kind of the plug for object-oriented over relational, uh, but relational also has a number of advantages of its own. Uh, so first off, relation by being record-oriented makes it really, really easy uh, to save things to disk. There's a very natural correspondence between rows and chunks of bytes that sit on a disk. Uh, by contrast, if you have a set of objects, uh, the objects can have pointers that are interconnected in every which way, and as a consequence of that, it's much harder to save a group of objects to disk because there's no kind of neat boundary where you can separate the objects. There's also no notion of objects as a kind of queryable entity. Uh, okay, so I'm probably demonstrating my age here. Has anyone used AppleScript? No? Okay, well, there's one, uh, it's a scripting language. One of the very nice features that it had was that you could ask give me all instances of a given object uh, by some property that that object holds. That is the one language where I've ever seen this as kind of a core uh, primitive. And a typical uh, object-oriented language doesn't, you, you can't uh, go in Java and say, give me all strings that you have in memory that start with the letter S. I mean, that's, well, Java just isn't set up for that kind of thing. Um, but in a relational model, you could very easily say, give me all students whose names begin with the letter S, or students whose, whose name includes uh, the substring Bob. That is, that's kind of what the, the system is set up for. And finally, um, SQL, or uh, the relational model, is really nicely set up for bulk processing, performing the same action iteratively on large uh, collections of data. And well, some of this, uh, these techniques have kind of leached into various programming languages. Uh, the map construct, for example, in uh, Ruby, Python, uh, Haskell's list comprehensions, Python's list comprehensions, all of this is kind of snuck into uh, various programming languages, but kind of the I mean, it's much easier to say, select average blah, blah, blah uh, from a given data source than it is to try and do something similar in a regular programming language, unless the programming language already has kind of explicit support for these aggregates. So um, the relational model has some advantages. The object-oriented model has some advantages. And what today we're going to focus on is what are the roadblocks? What are the, the kind of interfaces? How do you take these two kind of different worlds and merge them together? And kind of the core buzzword that you'll hear is ORMs. Um, now, depending on who you talk to, uh, what system you're referring to, or, well, any number of things, this could mean either object relational model or ob object relational mapping or mapper. Um, basically, it usually means which side of these two columns you're on. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but this kind of premise has been implemented in a very large number of, of systems out there. Uh, if you've heard of Rails, Django, uh, Hibernate, uh, Hibernate um, Link, these are all kind of ways of uh, putting relational features into a, uh, into a typical uh, normal object-oriented program programming language. Uh, conversely, on the other side, uh, there have been lots and lots of efforts to get object-oriented functionality uh, into SQL. Oracle is, is really, really gung-ho about uh, getting all of your data types, all uh, support for, excuse me, lots of different data types. SQL Server, um, there's uh, something called ob uh, Object Query Language, uh, basically lots and lots of different ways of kind of expressing object-oriented uh, interactions in a typical database. So kind of at the intersection of these two 
models, uh, there are basically three kind of general approaches that people have taken to, to merge the two. Uh, so there are what are called object relational mappers. And this is basically uh, programming language extensions that allow you to take, uh, object, uh, take an object-oriented programming language and kind of run SQL queries against it, or more precisely, to have um, the, the objects themselves stored in a typical uh, relational database, uh, both as a form of persistence and as support for querying. Uh, Rails, Django, Hibernate are kind of good examples of this. Uh, one thing that uh, one also sees is a, uh, the use of SQL as just a, a core construct, uh, a core way of expressing ideas, expressing uh, computation that kind of just gets embedded directly into a regular programming language. Um, example would be something like Link, uh, if anyone's ever heard of that. Uh, we'll see an example momentarily. Uh, and the final is uh, object relational models, uh, the final thing. Basically, practically every commercial database at this point has started incorporating various um, object-oriented features into it, uh, usually as part of its uh, user-defined type mechanism. Um, so for example, Oracle allows you to define uh, new uh, user-defined types through Java and access their methods. Um, or XML, uh, yes, oh, no. uh, XML, uh, JSON, both of these uh, kind of allow themselves to be accessed by standard um, object-oriented accessors. All right, uh, that, was, that was a bit of a rant there. Um, any questions up to this point? All right, so let's have a look uh, at these things in practice. So I have a couple of different uh, examples, one example of each of these three different models uh, that I'd like to run by you, demonstrate, basically show you how each of these works. So I don't expect you to kind of learn Ruby on the spot, uh, but most of this should kind of, the, the general structure of this uh, should be fairly straightforward, or at least I tried to make it so. Um, there are three diff uh, two different class definitions up top uh, with annotations on them uh, that basically kind of, each class defines an object that belongs to uh, this active record um, uh, a subclass of this active record class. Uh, and each of those objects defines essentially a class that gets mapped to, uh, or gets represented in a uh, SQL, uh, a, a standard relational database system. Um, you'll note that neither of those have schemas associated with them, uh, essentially because the schemas get loaded in from the relational database itself. So it can kind of uh, much more cleanly stay synced with the, the database. Um, now, both of these end up uh, essentially describing tables in the relational database. Uh, and well, correspondingly, there are foreign key relationships that can get defined through annotations uh, on the uh, various objects. What these annotations give us is the ability to query uh, the database, but to query it essentially using standard uh, object-oriented uh, methods. So for example, uh, the sales, uh, sorry, uh, the department class has a method corresponding to uh, employees, basically all of the employees in that particular department. And that, gets, uh, that comes about because there's this one-to-many relationship. So I could, for example, uh, find a department where uh, a given property is satisfied. The department is called sales. And I could get that as a unique object that I can then well, process as if it were a normal object in, in Ruby. Um, for example, I could then get all of the uh, employees and run some code for each of them. So uh, for each employee, I tally up the employee's salary. And again, the, the salary attribute of the employee is just another, uh, another, property, uh, another um, yeah, property of the employee object. 
And for example, if I wanted to get the uh, salary of the manager, I could, once again, uh, the, uh, the department instances of department have a property called manager, and instances of employee have that salary property. Any questions? Uh, so in Ruby, this gets, uh, yes, there's a schema mapping file. Uh, I'm hiding a lot of the, the, the there's a lot of kind of uh, mapping that has to be done, a lot of um, management. And there are a handful of utilities to kind of support establishing that mapping, maintaining that mapping, uh, keeping the scheme of the database up to date and so forth. Uh, so yeah, th this is kind of hiding a lot of the machinery that sits underneath it. But the idea is that the, uh, the language that you write your, your code in can be much uh, simpler, much easier to understand. Uh, by comparison, running the same queries in uh, writing a similar set of queries might be considerably more complex. Now we'll get back to this uh, example in a little bit, but uh, any other questions so far? All right. Uh, the other, uh, one other answer to uh, your comment, uh, a lot of it gets dynamically loaded as, so because Ruby is, uh, is an interpreted language, it can do a lot more on the fly, as it, as it were. All right, so that was, that's kind of an example of, of the first of these, um, this kind of object relational mapper. Uh, so you basically see each of the objects ends up getting mapped to a corresponding uh, SQL primitive, or relational primitive. Link is an example of a language where, or a language construct, where we actually take SQL and embed it into a regular relational language. So let's say I have uh, some collection of objects, and now this, it would be really, really easy if I could uh, express the, the kind of computation I wanted to do over that uh, collection of objects in SQL. Well, with link, you can essentially do that. Um, I have an object uh, instance here, this uh, collection of, uh, oh, sorry, this is in C sharp, by the way, uh, an extension to C sharp. Uh, so I have a array of integers uh, called array. And as you can see, the, I can just write SQL straight up in my C sharp code, and that uh, SQL can access all of my objects, and it can query all of my objects. Uh, so in this case, I can uh, pick out for every element in the array, it's slightly reordered SQL, uh, but I can basically select all of the elements that have, uh, in this case, that are greater than two, uh, do a sort on them, and then um, reconstruct them. And then the output of that is just another collection that I can query, uh, that I can use uh, as if it were a normal uh, C-sharp object. Questions? There's no database access here. Uh, there is a persistence layer that you can uh, add in addition to kind of the, the ability to query regular objects. But this, essentially what happens is that the SQL uh, there is an equivalent way of expressing the same computation in C sharp, just one that would be considerably more verbose. And so what they essentially do is compile the, the regular uh, SQL down to an equivalent C sharp. Does that address your concern? Yeah, exactly. It's the it's essentially the reverse of an o ORM. The you're using SQL to access normal uh, user space objects in in C sharp. Uh, like I said, you can also in, uh, integrate this with a database, but that's not kind of the core. There's an ORM as part of Link as well, but this is kind of the the neat bit. Uh, there are some cases where it makes sense to write your code as, uh, as 
uh, object, uh, just regular C sharp. There are some cases where it makes sense to write it as SQL. Um, SQL might be more compact, more understandable, uh, easier for the compiler to optimize. So it's uh, there. Uh, as talk, working with uh, the guys developing Scala for a while, and one of the things that they uh, observed was that just regular Scala expressions were super hard uh, to optimize. But if you kind of picked out a subset of Scala, a subset that essentially corresponds to what you can do with relational algebra, optimization suddenly became super, super easier. Um, basically, things like side effects, things like um, uh, you know, side effects were the main one. Uh, but if you can get rid, uh, if you can go down to a much smaller subset of the language, things become much easier to optimize. And this kind of forces you to go down to that subset. Uh, there's a similar thing that you can do with Scala that, again, uses a subset of Scala that has similar optimization capabilities. Does that address your, your question? OK, um, so the last one I wanted to bring up was uh, user-defined types in uh, Oracle. So this, there's an equivalent in SQL Server and uh, probably DB2 as well. Uh, the basic idea is that you can have types that are effectively tables. Uh, and what's happening here is that I'm defining uh, a set of orders uh, as a table of a particular order type. Uh, and I have another table called uh, customer, which has as one of its attributes an instance of this order set type. So essentially, every single customer has one or more uh, customer elements, or sorry, one or more order elements in it, and each order element is a full uh, relation. So the gimmick here is that whenever I create a new table, uh, sorry, when, whenever I create a new row in this order, uh, sorry, in this customer relation, I'm essentially creating an entirely new table as well. Now, that's not precisely what happens under the hood, but conceptually. I'm creating a new table every time I create a new row in uh, customer. Um, so to, uh, to fill in the values, here I have this. I basically have to pick out a select statement. And then um, when I want to pull contents out, I have to uh, essentially unwrap that collection. So here I'm, I'm basically flattening it out. And this is one of several different ways of kind of getting nested collection types in Oracle. There's it's a very complex system, but it's kind of the, yeah. You're right that the performance in the worst case is going to be much worse. Uh, so the, the comment is that uh, why, why do people use ORMs when, uh, given the fact that it's an additional layer of indirection, it might end up being much less performant. And yeah, uh, they do potentially end up being substantially less performant. Uh, there's a couple of advantages uh, to doing it this way. Uh, I, think, I think you hit it on the head there, that the, uh, the, most, the most important benefit for this particular model of uh, application development is that it allows you to work much faster. Um, 
by having all of your uh, by having this extra level of indirection, you can have uh, certain fields or attributes uh, hidden away behind getter setter methods. Uh, you can have lot, uh, and I think really the big win here is persistence. Uh, the big win for, for an object relational mapper is that it makes it very easy to save all of your objects uh, and just have them kind of persisted. You don't really have to worry about how they're being persisted or it just it hides a lot of the, the uh, annoyance associated with object serialization. Uh, you don't have to deal with memory management. I'm sure you guys are sick of that by now. Um, it's, it basically makes things a lot easier to work with. Uh, I think the other uh, tangential benefit is that it allows you to, uh, there's some cases where working with imperative object-oriented style code is a cleaner, much more readable approach. Uh, my first example, uh, student.classes subscript cse562.teacher is much more concise, and to me at least, much more readable than the equivalent SQL query. Um, Conversely, there are some cases where SQL is just so much more uh, effective at expressing what you want, what kind of computation you want, uh, really wide joins. Um, so uh, the, uh, the project submission system that you guys are using uh, is written in Rails. Uh, writing the core code, it just made so, like it, it's so much easier to work with imperative code uh, when trying to do a layout, for example, to dis uh, decide what you show the, the end user. Imperative code is so much easier, but every so often, like I want to gather some statistics, uh, how well the class is doing, how well the, uh, you know, what are the grades, what, how far have people gotten. That usually involves kind of a two or three way join between different attributes, and that, for that, uh, and that kind of reporting, statistics, having all of that backed to a database that allows me to run SQL queries over it is much easier. And I think kind of the, there's some advantages to imperative object-oriented programming, there's some advantages to uh, SQL, and this kind of gets you, uh, if used properly, the best of both worlds, if used improperly, the worst of both worlds. Um, so does that, there's a bit of a rant, but does that get your... Any other questions? All right, so, um, well, actually that leads me into my next uh, brief topic. Uh, if you ever should find yourselves using an ORM, and if you're going into industry, odds are you will encounter this in one form or another at some point. Uh, so how do you optimize an ORM, or how do you optimize the, the uh, a database instance for an ORM style application. So by now, you guys are all familiar with indexes, primary keys, foreign key constraints, and so forth. All of those are available. Uh, the core data management infrastructure behind all of this is a relational database. So um, if, uh, usually the ORM will build some indexes for you. Usually it'll give you some facility to provide uh, new index uh, in indexing capabilities. Uh, all of that is just as applicable here as it is in, uh, in a, re a full relational database, or standard relational database. But that said, uh, there's a couple of things that, uh, a couple of gotchas that very frequently occur when people try and use an ORM. So as an example, uh, I have this query up here uh, that basically for each department, uh, I would like to do something for each employee in that department. And then uh, the thing that I do for each employee is to print out the department and the employee name. How many queries do you think this is going to be? Or if I ran this code, how many query? This all gets back, it turned into a relational uh, standard relational query. So how many queries uh, would that hypothetically generate? Multiply by 100 departments into the number of Okay, so one to get all of the departments and then one more query for each uh, employee, right? 
because well, there's no, here I'm just getting all of the departments, and then here I actually have to do something for uh, the given employee. Uh, could I do this better in SQL if I were writing this as a direct uh, SQL query? What, what, is, what is this effect, uh, essentially equivalent to? I hear whispers. Nested what? Nested loop join. Yeah, so th this is basically a join. I'm joining department and employee on a foreign key attribute. I could do this in a single query, and I guarantee you it's going to be much faster if I do it as a single query than an, as a sequence of uh, secondary queries. So that's kind of the, the downside, or one, one of the, the things to uh, be aware of is that depending on how these statements, you are still working with a relational database, so depending on how these statements get uh, written, uh, you might need to uh, kind of hint some things to the ORM uh, because the queries that get written might end up being a little too small. Now, what if the employee's relation has like a really big field? Like there's a, a transcript log of every single activity that that employee has ever performed. Horrible database design, but what if, what if that were the case? Would, how would, um, perhaps a better, query, uh, better question, what are those queries that get issued to the database? There are, th uh, there are two, uh, well, n plus one different queries that get sent here. What are those n plus one queries? Or, let's make this even easier. What's the first query that gets sent? Select from departments. Select what from departments? Select name. Now, it, so if you were writing this yourself, you could do it as select name. Um, what, a, uh, what will often happen in an ORM is that as a simplification, because uh, they want to be able to, the, they'll load the entire uh, row into, uh, into the, the client application at once. Because if you're accessing one field, odds are you're going to want to access other fields. And it doesn't really have a way to predict which fields you end up accessing. Now, this varies based on ORM. But uh, more likely, what will happen is it will run a select star from, uh, from relation. So does anyone see a, an immediate problem with that? Uh, yeah, so what if your relation is really big? What if you have one column that's uh, a couple of kilobytes per row? This um, ends up producing uh, a huge amount of inefficiency. And uh, well, that's kind of well, what this all boils down to is uh, a question of loading data between the ORM. And this really addresses your, your question. The uh, you want to be able to, uh, you have this additional layer of indirection, and this layer of indirection has to make certain assumptions about how you're going to use uh, the, the data. Um, some of those assumptions end up being a little too uh, strong. You end up having to issue more queries than you need. If those assumptions end up being a little too weak, you end up getting more data loaded in than you need, again, introducing inefficiency. Uh, so again, if you ever happen to find yourselves using an ORM, uh, there's a couple of things to watch out for. And the, the first is that you can usually provide some hints about uh, how you're using the data. Now, uh, as an example, there is a way of 
uh, rewriting that, that query that I had on the previous slide, uh, a method called include, that basically says, when you issue this query to the database, I'm going to want to eventually be doing a lookup on the employees. Uh, uh, employees property of this so why don't you run your query and, and kind of prefetch the employees as well using one query uh, the nice thing about this though is that it kind of supports uh, well, the, the agile development model you, you can basically run your your write your program very simplistically and then kind of figure out where you want to optimize after the fact uh, after you've kind of recognized where your uh, uh, where the optimization effort needs to go in. Uh, so by kind of supporting the, the regular uh, query processing with these hints, you can kind of work your, you, you have something that kind of works immediately and the facility to kind of extend that with more complex interactions. Um, the other thing is that many of these ORMs uh, the, the granularity at which the objects get loaded in is usually the entire uh, row. So another kind of trick is to decouple the objects, to basically take something that should conceptually be one object and kind of split it into two different objects uh, so that you can load things in uh, a little bit more at a time. All right, any questions? That's kind of been the practical application side of ORMs. All right, so let's take a uh, really quick break, uh, five minutes, and we'll get into uh, something a little, we'll switch over from the super practical to the super abstract. All right, let's move on. So I hope I didn't overwhelm you with too much implementation level detail. Uh, now we're gonna move into something a little more uh, abstract, poetic, if you will. Um, so to that end, what is an object? What's an object? Hmm? It's an instance of a class, and what is a class? Okay, so it's a tuple of a set of attributes and a set of verbs that can act on uh, instances of that tuple. Um, so yeah, it's basically uh, a set of attributes. And kind of what distinguishes it from the tuples that we've been dealing with so far is you know, one uh, rather nasty observation that the, the attributes can be uh, sets or more precisely can be collections of other uh, instances. Um, there's kind of this over, uh, subclassing, overloading uh, business as well. That I'm not gonna get into because pretty much every ORM uh, shuns that or uh, stays away from that to varying degrees. Uh, but the, the kind of core thing here is, uh, or the, the core interesting thing that a lot of ORMs uh, delve into is this idea of collections. Now why is this uh, so uh, interesting? And by ORMs this time I mean object relational models, so the, the database-y side of, side of things. Now the observation uh, is that collect, uh, putting collections inside of other objects is hard. Um, why is that? What's, uh, what might make putting a collection inside an object uh, hard? So here's an example collection, a string. Okay, so there's one immediate problem in terms of representation. How do you uh, encode uh, this variable-sized object? Uh, even a string gives, gives you a lot of problems, and that's a, a, a collection of characters. What if the collections can include collections can include collections? Um, just encoding all of that is much more difficult. 
Uh, so including all of that is much more dif difficult. Uh, what about uh, querying these? Do we need, how, how do we ask questions about these nested collections? Silence, good. And I have something to talk about. Um, the, what we're going to talk about now in terms of what I'm going to focus on right now is uh, I'm going to start discussing how we ask questions about these nested objects. So storing, storing the, the data is, is difficult. But even just asking questions about nested objects turns out to be surprisingly hard. Let me back up a little bit. Uh, when I say asking questions, I mean asking questions in a way that we can optimize. But let me back up a little bit. And uh, let's have a look at how this is done in the, the Oracle case. So recall, we had these table objects, and we had some way of kind of uh, wrapping a table up into a uh, larger object, and we had some way of unwrapping uh, those tables so that we could access their contents. And this is uh, basically people have uh, in the many decades that people have been doing research on databases and nested collections, they basically come up with a handful of ways of asking questions about data. And this is uh, representative of one of the three basic approaches to, uh, to querying nested data that uh, people have come up with. Uh, and this is called nested relational algebra. So the, the core idea here, and this is pretty much the simplest version of this, uh, the core idea is that you take regular relational algebra, select, project, union, join, etc. But you have the ability to have uh, nested collection types. And you add two new operators, the so-called nest and unnest operation. So nest, you can kind of think of as just the group by of uh, of a group by aggregate. No aggregation, just the group by. So the aggregate value, or where the aggregate value would be, now becomes a collection. So in my example up here, I'm grouping by the first attribute. And as you can see, the, uh, I have two instances of uh, one, one instance of three, and I end up with uh, a tuple for one and a tuple for three. Similarly, I have an unnest operation that kind of reverses that, that takes a uh, individual, a tuple with a nested collection, and it kind of explodes that tuple, uh, denormalizes it, if you will. Now, this kind of interface is really, really uh, simple to optimize, because basically anything that we've done uh, previously to, to optimize relational algebra expressions, we can take that and pretty much just apply it directly here. Uh, these are two new operators. We kind of need to integrate, integrate them uh, a little bit. But the, the basic uh, push down selections, push down uh, projections, optimizations all apply here. And as it turns out, the, if you start out with something that is a uh, that is in sort of standard relational form, this kind of query language doesn't introduce any additional power. Um, we can have this nest and unnest operator, and while that does allow us to work with uh, collections, this actually ends up becoming more or less equivalent to regular SQL, uh, to regular relational algebra. Now, the, the kind of basic, uh, because it's so basic, it ends up getting adopted in lots of uh, it has ended up being adopted in lots of uh, different uh, kind of uh, core uh, commercial database uh, contexts, as well as a, uh, the, the nest and unnest operators uh, appear in a language called Pig Latin, which uh, if you're working with MapReduce, you'll probably encounter sooner or later. 
Uh, really, there's, there's not much to say about this other than it exists. Um, it's kind of a nifty extension to the, the, the basic idea of relational algebra. Uh, any questions on nest and unnest? Yeah, but, I mean, well, mm, not quite, but it basically uh, uh, nest is analogous to an operation called group in uh, in Pig Latin, which kind of runs over MapReduce. And yeah, you're right. Uh, basically, this is quite analogous. Uh, nest is quite analogous to the MapReduce interface. Um, or the interface between the map task and the reduce task. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is well, uh, let me uh, amend that. Uh, reduce is essentially equivalent to an aggregate function. And like I said, this is basically the group by without the aggregate. Another thing is uh, flatten, yeah. fold. OK, um, so this is kind of the, the basic uh, extension to relational algebra. Uh, and it's pretty handy. It can be incorporated very easily. But it is, there are certain kinds of things that you can't uh, express in what you might think of as a very optimal way. What do I mean by that? So let's say I have this query here where I'm going to start out with a schema for a relation R that has an attribute A that's just a primitive type, and it, an attribute B that is a table of two more attributes, C and D. And I have this query here where I first unnest R, basically spread out all of the, the B attributes, denormalize it, project down, or project away the C column, and then gather everything back. So essentially now I end up with, what is a schema? What's my schema for the output? If I drop the C column, Let's do this step by step. I start out with R, which has a, an A and a B, and the Bs are all tables of C and D. All right, so I've got my data here. What do I get after I uh, unnest? What's my schema, first of all? A, C, D, and then I've got one, two, three, two, four, five, two, six, seven. Okay, project. That's easy. And now what do I get after I re-nest? A1, which has a B of D3. 2, which has a B of 5 and 7. OK, cool. So my schema here is A with a table B of D. So was this the most efficient thing that I could possibly do, going through all of these steps? Right, so in terms of expressiveness, this is quite powerful, but in terms of efficiency, it would make a lot more sense to first visit this 
project away the C, then visit this, project away the C. That would have the same effect, but it would end up, uh, it's not something that I can express here. I have to first unnest everything and then potentially re-nest everything back if I want. Um, so, what does this lead me to? This leads me to something uh, developed at UPenn uh, called the Monad Algebra. And this is kind of a really, really nifty idea for uh, manipulating relational types. And it kind of maps, uh, it was originally developed for managing biological data, but it turns out that uh, this kind of ends up acting as a primitive for a lot of the work on XML, uh, which we'll discuss next lecture. So, core idea of monad algebra. Every query is a function. So, think of a relational algebra expression. You, evaluate, you apply the relational algebra expression to a relation, and you get back a relation. Same idea here. You have uh, an, uh, a function, uh, an algebra expression. You apply that to a object, not a relation now, we're applying it to an object and we get back an object. Keep this in mind because it's uh, one object goes into the function, one object comes out of the function because this is a little bit non-intuitive, especially as we get to these, for these next immediate slides. So what does the monad algebra look like? Well, there's a handful of kind of base functions that you can compose together to produce more complex structures. And the first of these uh, is really the simplest possible thing that you could have, the identity. And this is ID, uh, identity. Um, you apply it to an object, you get back the same object. Nothing fancy. Any questions about this general format? The, okay, this is the simple one. This is the slightly less simple one, the constant function. Now, again, everything is a function. So. Uh, the constant, the, the way mon uh, monad algebra expresses constants, is also as functions. The gimmick, though, is that the, uh, the constant function returns back a constant. It ignores its input entirely. Uh, so, for example, I could have a function, and I'm going to distinguish the, uh, the constant functions with a little hat sign. Um, so 3 hat is a function that always evaluates to 3. No matter what its input is, the output will always be 3. Just in case that isn't immediately obvious, uh, I have the Java code for an equivalent version of this function. It takes an input. The, the API is always, it takes one object as an input. But in this case, the output is always the constant 3. Any questions? This is where everyone always gets tripped up. OK, I hope I've explained this right. Anyway, this is, this is kind of somewhat non-obvious. So the second you don't understand what I am saying, raise your hand. OK, so we've got identity and we've got constant. Basically, I have a way to take the input, get a constant value. Now, there's a way to construct a tuple. We have two different kinds of collection types, tuples and sets in monad algebra. To construct a tuple, we have this tuple function, which takes two functions of any other type, f and g. f and g are any kind of function. They could be identity, they could be constant, they could be another tuple function. And I take f and I take g, and then I evaluate those on whatever input I'm given, and the results become the two fields of a tuple. You have more fields if you want, but this is, I'm just doing this in a simple way with two, tuple, two fields in a tuple. As an example, I could construct a tuple that consisted of three and then whatever my input is. So I pass the three hat function and I pass the identity function and then I get back a tuple three comma whatever my input was. Questions? There will be a quiz in two or three slides. 
That said, any questions? How are we going to use it? You'll see in a moment. That will be part of the quiz. Uh, all right, one other thing I want to bring up, uh, or sorry, two, two more uh, operators I want to bring up. So we've got identity, we've got constant, and we've got tuple constructor. If we have a way of constructing tuples, we also had better have a way of accessing the, con the content of a tuple. So I can uh, project either the left or the right hand side of a tuple. So if I've got the uh, if I've got a tuple x, y as input, then I project the left-hand side, I get x. I project the right-hand side, I get y. So I project left of 3, comma bob, I end up with 3. That one's a little bit easier. And finally, composition. I can take two different functions, and I can apply one to the output of the other. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one last one. I can also do basic arithmetic. Yes? Yeah, so if I, I could compose. Uh, F. So composition takes two inputs, but it's associative. So I can do F compose H compose, uh, sorry, F compose G compose H. And that's F compose G composed with H, or F composed with G composed with H. Yes? Yep, that is entirely correct. Tuple of function comma function is itself a function. Uh, so, sorry, I, I've, I was not uh, clear on the types, um, but yes, there are, um, there are kind of conceptually two different uh, types in this uh, language. There's uh, the type of function, which is map object to object, and then there's the type object, which can be either a primitive type, uh, integer, string, etc., uh, a tuple of objects, or a set of objects. And the functions operate over the, uh, the objects. So the function can't operate over uh, other functions in the monad algebra. Does that address your question? No. Oh, I think I meant it. So there's also a notion of arithmetic, which I was going to get to in about a slide, in one more slide. What do you mean by plus? Oh, uh, com uh, composition, you mean? This? This. Ah, OK. So um, I can also define arithmetic. So if I want to uh, take two numbers and add them together, I first have to compute the numbers that I want to add. That's a function. And then I apply whatever arithmetic I want on top of the output of those two functions. So you can, uh, another way of looking at this is uh, as actually a slightly cleaner way of looking at this that I've seen people use is as each arithmetic operator operates on a tuple x, y, and returns or computes the sum of those two, or addition is a function, let's call this addition hat, is a function that operates on uh, a tuple of, uh, a pair of integers, and it adds those two integers together. So the, I'll be honest, the original paper that defines this doesn't really include arithmetic. Um, 
arithmetic is kind of a practical concern that got added in the implement in their implementation. Uh, I mean, you need arithmetic in order to make this actually usable, but from a programming language standpoint, uh, addition is defined, assuming you have some definition for addition over two primitive types, this kind of works. So it's addition on primitive types. It, exactly. Or it's addition on, if this is defined, this is defined. Yes. Uh, you could. So um, let me stick to a consistent syntax. Uh, the question is, uh, you can't add three hat and ID. Um, in fact, that is is basically input plus three. Does that address your concern? A function that is equal to x plus 3, or well, 3 plus x, if you want to be literal. OK? All right. And we can use a similar method for uh, computing an if then else. All right. So that said. What does this do? Produces ID. How does how did you get that? So get the left side of constructing the tuple of input, comma input plus two, but because I'm projecting the left-hand side of that, I end up with just ID. So you've anticipated my, my question. You can actually optimize this down to just ID. And in fact, this is uh, something we'll, we'll be getting back to uh, in the couple of minutes that we have left. Uh, kind of the, the core idea is that this, uh, you can, partially evaluate these expressions, come up with simpler expressions, and because of that, you end up with a much simpler, uh, you essentially end up with a set of relational, uh, a set of monad uh, algebra optimizations that are kind of equivalent to the uh, relational algebra optimizations that we've encountered before. So, okay, I promised you collections. Uh, collections you shall have. Um, the two basic collection operators in monad algebra are give me a collection and give me an empty collect or give me a collection consisting of one element and give me a collection consisting of no elements. Um, and here curly braces denote a collection or a set of values. So curly brace function gives me the value defined by uh, applying that function to the input. And again, curly brace is itself a function. So for example, I could apply uh, the function curly brace three hat comma ID and get, uh, to the value one and get three one as, or is just the tuple three one? A collection containing a single tuple three comma one. Yep. And the, the kind of core coolest thing, or the, the, the heart of this language, are two functions uh, called map and flatten. So map allows me to apply a function to every element of the collection. I have a function f, and I can apply that to every element of the collection. Um, so in this case, I could do uh, get, for example, uh, I have x1, x2. I could apply map to that and get uh, f of x1, f of x2, and so forth. Flatten, yes? The comment is this looks uh, similar to uh, map functions in concurrent ML. Yeah, uh, and in fact, 
every programming language worth its salt has a map function or something equivalent implemented in it. Um, Java not included. Um, this uh, I mean, map is kind of one of, if you, uh, any language that pretends to operate over sets is going to have something analogous to map. Uh, MapReduce has it, ML has it, uh, Ruby has it, Python has it, Haskell has it. Um, list, uh, you might encounter it under the name list comprehensions. Uh, okay. List comprehensions can simulate map. I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but yeah, uh, map is kind of one of the most fundamental things. Take a function and apply it to every element of a set. That is one of the most fundamental things that you can do with a, uh, a collection of objects. And so you'll see it everywhere. Uh, the other one is flatten that takes a collection of collections. So here I have x1, x2, uh, blah, blah, blah y1, y2, both as collections in, a, uh, in their own collection. Um, and so flatten is going to un basically do one level of unnesting on those nested collections. OK, so here's uh, another little quiz. What does this do? I have uh, if x equals 3, then I return x. Otherwise, I, uh, the collection x, otherwise I return empty set. I take that whole function, I apply it to every element of my input, and then I flatten the result. Yeah, in the back. Yep, and if is a function. Everything is a function. Very first slide. Everything is a function. In this case, it's a function that returns either that or that. All right. What is, uh, uh, sorry, what was the question? What's it operating on? I thought you were going to Oh, I. Uh, that's what I'm about to do. I was just wondering if anyone could actually parse that, yeah? Okay, uh, is there a equivalent term that you've encountered before? Let Good. All right, so let's, let's do a quick example, but yes. Uh, Congratulations. It, this is essentially doing selection. Um, so let's uh, have a set of elements. One, two, three. All right. Um, now, I want to first map this function over every element. So I'm going to get f of 1, f of 2, f of 3. And that's all the elements. So what do I get when I apply that to f uh, to 1? Empty set. That to 2? Empty set. And what about to 3? Three? 3. And now what happens when I apply? Uh, I should have picked a different number. Uh, what happens when I apply flatten to that? I just get, yep. So that contributes nothing, that contributes nothing, that contributes three, and I end up with a collection containing just three. Now, just in the interest of keeping it simple, I didn't want to include uh, tuppling in there, but let's say I had uh, something that looked like this. Um, one, how might I change that 
to get me all tuples containing Bob, or contain where the uh, the second attribute was Bob. Okay, so I'd replace x equals three with uh, project right. equals, and again, this is a function, so I give it a little hat. All right, great. Uh, OK. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, so we are running low on time. I have a couple of other examples that I will uh, post to Piazza. Uh, but um, basically, Actually, the, the big challenge is this. So pair with, the one other thing that you can do with monad algebra is called pair with. It takes a tuple a pair of a value in a collection, and it applies that value to every element of the collection. Um, big challenge for you on Piazza. How do you implement this uh, using, uh, how do you implement a join using pair with? Um, so last, uh, final thoughts. Monad algebra is essentially equivalent to nested relational algebra in terms of expressive power, uh, but because of the fact that it has both uh, map and composition as explicit uh, operators, it makes it much easier to optimize because you can express all of the optimizations natively. Um, and kind of that optimization takes uh, two forms. First, you try and push all of the composition as far down as possible, essentially, up, uh, for example, you can compose two maps together. And then you try and evaluate things as aggressively as you can. Any subtree of this uh, expression, you can potentially evaluate it. Uh, we've seen some examples. Uh, there are some nifty things you can do in terms of logical logging with the monad algebra. Uh, I unfortunately do not have time to talk about them. Uh, but we will get back to languages for querying hierarchical data uh, next uh, class, which will be the last one, and we'll cover uh, basically ways of uh, things like XPath and XQuery. All right, any final questions? Great. All right, so see everyone on Wednesday. <laughs>